just thrilled you're here, and I love Fenwick Island, I love this church, and it's just so amazing. When I come here, it's so encouraging to me to see you guys, and some of you were originally at the Millsburg campus, and lots of you are new to this campus and new to Bayshore, and we're so glad you're here. I'm Pastor Danny, and uh, you get to see me in 3D today. I'm like in full (laughs) develop, so I'm so glad that I got to be with you today. We love you guys, and I appreciate you, and I want to just give a high five to uh, the people in the sound booth. One of the most important groups in this church is the guys in the sound booth, Gavin Fruscio and Brad King. Brad's got that beard going on, and I got a little beard, a wannabe beard, you know, but uh, Brad's my hero, and uh, Gavin is just uh, really doing a great job as well, and I'm so excited about Chase and uh, Callie being here. What a great blessing they are to this church already. By the way... Chase is having a birthday on Tuesday, so it's his birthday, so make sure Amazon gift cards, whatever, you know. We love that boy. We're very grateful for, for Chase. But we're so glad you're here today. And I want to say hello to the Millsburg campus. Would you give the Millsburg campus a big hand right now? All right. And I just want to say, it was last Sunday, the water baptism was so great, and we just loved uh, being a part. Both of our campuses come together. It was really, really amazing. So we just had a great Sunday together. So we're really grateful that we got to do that together. Uh, listen, we're in a series called Crazy Church People, and if you're new to Bayshore and maybe you're watching online, one of the things that we do at Bayshore is we like to study the Bible section by section. And uh, one of the reasons we do that is we want people to think for themselves. We want people to get enough background in the Bible that they can read the Bible themselves. And maybe you're not a believer yet. Maybe you're not following Jesus yet, but you're inquisitive and you're interested. So we want to, you know, give you some background so you can read the Scripture for yourself and uh, really see what it says. And we're uh, excited about doing that. So uh, one of the other advantages of doing this is it makes us talk about stuff we normally avoid. Uh, You know, it's amazing how preachers can duck so many subjects in the Bible just by going to their favorite things. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is make sure that we don't duck anything that's important. So today we're coming to a really interesting passage, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, this is one of the most, I say this a lot, but this is one of the most important uh, chapters in the whole New Testament. Because in this chapter, it talks about the resurrection of our human bodies. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you think much about your future. You know, I think we don't know a lot about what happens after we die. And the reason we don't know a lot about it, I'm talking about Christians, that we've been coming to church for years and all that. The reason we don't know much about it is that we have such an aversion to talk about death, that we just avoid that, and we want to make everything positive and everything. And uh, But hey, listen, I'm all about that. You know, I want to be positive. I'm, I'm enjoying my life and, and all of that. But the reality is, you know, Karen, her family went to, a number of years ago, went to a lawyer uh, to work on their, uh, their, their, uh, in their wills and all the stuff at the end of life. And, and they're sitting around in front of the lawyer, and they said to the lawyer, you know, we wanted to meet with you just in case something happens to mom and dad. And, uh, and so the lawyer says, well, let me clear something up. It's not just in case something happens to mom and dad. Mom and dad are going to die. And that's how he opened it up, you know. And the truth is, you know, death is a part of life. And because we don't talk about it, we don't know. Christians are completely ignorant about what happens after we die. And the reason we should talk about this is because, do you know that we'll spend most of our time on the other side of the grave? In fact, just think about it this way. If you uh, go to the Atlantic Ocean, Fenwick Island State Park, you go out there and you got an eyedropper, and you get down on your knees in the wet sand, and you suck a little seawater into that eyedropper, and you look at that eyedropper, about one milligram of water is in that eyedropper. When you look out into the ocean in front of you, the amount of seawater in the ocean in front of you is, listen to this, you can Google anything. 82 point billion billion gallons of water are in the Atlantic Ocean, and you have a little millimeter of seawater. Now, what we have to do, what we tend to do in life, is we look at the we look at the eyedropper and we put all of our focus on the eyedropper as what is most important, and that is our life. That is your life compared to eternity. So we really need to know more about what happens 
on the other side of the grave and to understand that well. So Paul, he, de- he dealt with this with the Corinthians. They were confused about what happened after they died. And so he dealt with that issue. And let me read to you a little bit uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 12 through 12, 35. We're not going to read all of this, but we're going to read uh, some of this. And there's, I would wish I could go through the whole chapter uh, verse by verse, but we're going to do a summary today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 12 says, but if, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Jesus from the dead but he did not, if he did not raise him from the dead, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people to be most pitied. Now, what's going on in Corinth is the, uh, the culture around them had a view about death would happen. And what had happened is the Corinthian people had sort of imbibed or taken in the view of the culture. Now, there were like maybe a couple views of what people thought about death in those days. First view was was Epicureanism. Epicureanism is a, is a, is a philosophy that says when you die, you die. And that's it. Lights out. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And that was just down the road. Athens wasn't far from Corinth, and that's what they believed in Athens, that not not everybody, but the more wealthy people, more wealthy people that had slaves and all of that. And Epicureanism basically said that, listen, you better enjoy fine wine now. You better enjoy your villas now. You better enjoy, uh, you know, everything in life now, fine food, sex, enjoy life Because when you die, that is it. About 13% of Americans believe that there is nothing after death, that that's it, lights out. And some of you probably know some people like that, and that they feel like that there is no life after death. And so Paul is dealing with that, and he says, how can some of you, if we believe as Christians that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can we say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So he's probably addressing some Epicureanism that's kind of seeped into the church. But there's this other thing, too. And this was probably more prominent. And that was that when you died, uh, you know, your body, and this was what the Greeks believed, and later on there was a group, uh, a, a movement called Gnosticism, that believed that your body was evil, that flesh was evil. So therefore, your body is a prison And when you die, you escape from the prison of your body, and you are sort of like a disembodied spirit. And you're sort of, this is what I call the Casper, Casper the ghost theory. And they believe that you were just basically a disembodied spirit after you died. Paul said, wrong. That's not wrong. That's not right. And, and that was what a lot of people believe. And you know what? What we have to remember is, is that we have a tendency to let culture shape what we believe. And in the Corinthian church, they were kind of buying into the general idea of what they saw on you know, documentaries on CNN or whatever, things that they were hearing. And that was the view that they were coming to. And Paul said, these are wrong views. Now, here's what he is proposing here and he has a way of looking at this he has a uh, a logical way of looking at this he says if a is true then b must be true as well if b is not true then a is not true either basically he says if christ has been raised from the dead physically then you will be raised from the dead physically as well 
And so he's pointing to a physical resurrection. You will have, if you are a follower of Jesus, according to Scripture, according to the New Testament, if you are a uh, follower of Jesus, you will have a physical resurrection from the dead. You will not be a, a spirit floating in the universe on a cloud playing a harp, and that doesn't even sound like fun to me. But you will be raised from the dead. And here's the, here's the idea. You will be raised physically from the dead. And here's, here's, the, here's the big idea today. What is true of Jesus will be true of you. What is true of Jesus will be true of you. So what kind of resurrection did Jesus have? We have to go to Luke 24 to get a little peek at that. This is really interesting. Luke 24 says this about Jesus. Luke 24 it says, this is the, on the Resurrection Sunday, this is Easter, first, first Sunday of the resurrection. And here's what it says about Jesus' resurrection. Very important, because remember, Paul is dealing with an idea that says, you know, you're going to escape your physical body, your evil body, your body is terrible. Physical things are bad. Physical things are evil. Physical things are just of the darkness. And you're going to be a spirit, and you're going to be uh, this purified spirit, and you'll no longer have a physical existence. Now look at what Jesus' resurrection looks like. Luke 24, verse 37 they were startled and frightened, thinking, this is talking about when they saw Jesus, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Hey, listen, let's pause there a minute. How many know that God is patient with doubting people and the original disciples were doubters? They struggled to believe. They, 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 this just blew their mind. And, you know, we think, you know, in the... Uh, in the ancient world, the New Testament, we think that those people are just gullible. They just believed everything. They're just like us. When this man came back from the dead, they're like, this is not happening. This is like, this is a, I'm like, I'm, I had too much pizza last night. There is something going on here. And so here's what it says. Uh, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. So they first thought, well, they must be seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise on your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, he was raised physically. He had flesh and bones, and that's uh, very important. He was not a ghost. He was not a disembodied spirit. You will not be a disembodied spirit. You're going to have a physical resurrection uh, in the future. When he said that, when, when he had said this, they, he showed him, them his hands and feet. Look at my hands and feet. And while they still did not believe... It, is because of joy, it was because of joy and amazement. He asked them, do you have anything to eat? Do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Somebody in the group was, I guess, health conscious, so it was broiled fish. <laughs> now, I'm here to tell you, I'm not a big broiled fish fan. I'm a deep fried fish fan. I mean, I know I shouldn't. I was at Matt's fish camp with some friends a couple weeks ago, and I got the fish and chips. And by the way, it is amazing there. I mean, it's like it's putting a, you know, a caulk gun to your heart. But I mean, it was amazing. Uh, and they gave him some broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in, his, in their presence. Now, why did he do that? He did that to demonstrate that he was physically raised from the dead, and it, this was not some type of illusion, and he ate it in their presence. Now, a couple things about that. First of all, they recognized that it was Jesus in the future. When you're raised from the dead uh, in the future, uh, what the New Testament teaches, when you're raised from the dead, people will physically recognize you. It's not like, you know, we're just sort of these, you know, unidentifiable, translucent objects kind of walking and bumping into each other. Your physical appearance will be recognizable to people that know you and there's a tangibleness to his to his resurrection they said he said touch me and feel me because a ghost does not have flesh and blood 
our physical resurrection, the future will be tangible. You'll be able to touch uh, and care for each other and all of that. And then he was able to eat as well. Not, I'm not sure if he was driven by hunger. I'm not so sure that you'll be hungry in your new body, but you will have the capacity to eat because we have the marriage supper of the Lamb in the book of Revelation. So that's an important thing. So there is what you want to understand about what Scripture teaches about the physical resurrection is our physical resurrection, our resurrection will be like Jesus because what, is, what happened to Jesus will happen to us, and he's demonstrating the type of resurrection we will have. And when Paul is teaching on this to the Corinthian church, he's like combating this false idea of this, this, this sort of mystical resurrection where you'll be some kind of identif- un- unidentifiable ghost in the future, and he's dealing with that. Now, here's an interesting scripture. I'm just going to touch on this real quickly. Uh, You know, this is one of the weirdest scriptures in the whole New Testament, and uh, it has, has a purpose. And I guarantee you, you've never heard a sermon on this on this verse. Now, maybe you have, but I highly doubt it. Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 and 53, this this little little interesting verse about the resurrection of Jesus, and it says, and the tombs broke open. This is after the veil in the temple was written, uh, was ripped in half, and it says, and the tombs were open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, I have never heard a sermon on that. But it says that when Jesus was raised from the dead, at the moment that he was raised from the dead, there were other people that were raised from the dead at the same time. Now, why is that? Why is that in the verse? Can you ima- in the Bible, why would you, what, can you imagine being you know, in Jerusalem, cutting your grass, you've been cutting your grass, and then you did your weed eating, and Uncle John comes walking down the driveway, and he died 20 years ago. How many know that would freak you out? And so Uncle John comes walking down, and why is that in the Bible? It shows that there is a parallel, and this is what Paul teaches in this text. There's a parallel between the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of other people, the physical resurrection. So God is, in his word here, through the Apostle Paul, he says if it is true of Jesus, if Jesus had a physical resurrection then our resurrection will be physical as well, and it will be tangible, and it will be real. So it's important for us to understand that, because when we come to a point where uh, someone that we love dearly, you know, passes away, and they're they're a believer, and they're a follower of Jesus, you know, uh, we have to sort of, in our minds, think about what is going to happen in the future for them. And Paul gives this incredible uh, teaching on the physical resurrection of Jesus. And he goes on to say, you know, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, and if the resurrection, the physical resurrection of people uh, is not a fact, it's not a reality, then, then this whole thing is a hoax. In fact, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, everything that we do is a waste of time. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, every sermon I prepared for the last 40 years, 40 years, I can't tell you how many hours I put in, you know, getting ready to talk so I look like I'm clothed in my right mind when I get in front of people, you know? Uh, all of that is a waste. Every, everything, every volunteer thing you do is a waste if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. And he says beyond this, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, you are still in your sins. You still have a problem. You have a sin issue. But I'm grateful because when Jesus was raised from the dead, when he came out of that tomb, I'm telling you, when he was raised from the dead, it verified that the cross worked. It verified that every time you stumble, every time you sin, every time you fail, and you ask the Lord to forgive you, he cleanses you because the cross is effective and the cross takes care of all your sin and guilt. Can you say a big amen? You know, I'm in, you know, I mentioned last Sunday about crucifixes, and I'm not, you know, against Catholic people. We got a whole bunch of people at Bayshore that are former Catholics. It's unbelievable. I meet these Catholics in, in, our, in our new members' classes and everything, and they're just like everywhere, and they, they always want to know what, what should we call you, 
because they're used to, you know, a different system. I say, please, please call me Holy Father if you would. Just please. <laughs> but, you know, you go into a Catholic church and, and you see the crucifixes and Christ on the cross. And, and uh, Karen and I, we love to go to, you know, Europe and different places and walk through all these cathedrals. We love to see these beautiful cathedrals. But when you see the Christ on the cross, it is half of the gospel. And when I see an empty cross, in fact, I was riding down the road and I saw the Lutheran cross at the Lutheran church not far from here. And I saw that empty cross. I was coming home from a wedding I did last night. And I saw that empty cross. And that empty cross reminded me that Christ has been raised from the dead. And because he's been raised from the dead, all of my sins, every one of them, every sin, thought, word, and deed, in the present, in the past, in the future, my sins have been forgiven because the cross is empty. And Paul said, if, the, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, you're, st you're still in your sins, and we're preaching a fraudulent gospel. But because Christ has been raised from the dead, and, and it was the fundamental message of the early church. Every series, you know, Paul or Peter would get up and say, we're starting a new series today, and the new series today is the resurrection of Jesus. And they'd go eight, ten weeks on that, and they'd say, we're starting a new series today, resurrection of Jesus. The only thing they preached about the only thing they preached about in the book of Acts, the only theme was the resurrection of Jesus. And there's incredible ramifications of Jesus being raised from the dead, and this text develops it. But let me talk a little bit about, about the different type of bodies that we'll have one day. And uh, this is a, an interesting thing. Now, if you go further down in the text, which is, I think is really where it really gets interesting, uh, if you go down to like uh, verse 42, I'll find it in a second here. If I scroll up here. Verse 42, 1 Corinthians 42, it says uh, this here. It says, so, so will be the resurrection of the dead. The body, we're talking about a burial here. He basically develops this idea that one of the questions was, well, if there's a resurrection of the body, you know, what, the physical, a physical resurrection, what kind of physicality will that be? And Paul says, well, you know, there's all kinds of different physicalities. There's a, you know, there's a, you know, you put a seed in the ground. That's a physical material thing. You put a seed in the ground. You put it in the ground, and then a watermelon comes out of that. You got a watermelon plant. You got a watermelon. It's, a, it's another physical expression. It's bigger, and it's different. And Paul develops this idea that this physical, uh, we have different physicalities, and so there's different types. You know, just because it's different, that our physical resurrection in the future is different, it doesn't mean that it isn't physical. So then he says, this is important, he says in verse 42, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead, the body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. Now, it is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown in natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. Now, when it says it's raised a spiritual body, it doesn't mean it's a spiritual body like a ghost. It means that it's animated, it's generated by spiritual life. So when it says the body that is sown perishable, now what does a perishable body, what does it mean to have a perishable body? Now, here's, here's, here's something I want you to, to get there. Everybody in Millsboro, everybody at Femke Island, Everybody here right now, everybody in front of me, you have a perishable body. You are in a perishable body. Now, what does that mean? Now, in the Greek, the perishable, a perishable body means prone to decay, prone to uh, corruption, prone to wearing down, prone to die. We're in a body that will die. doesn't matter how much kale you eat, you're going to die. <laughs> now, I think you should eat kale, and I think you should exercise. Uh, you know, I saw Joel up here leading worship day. I mean, Joel has been working out. He is looking good. He's ripped, and he's skinny, and I'm like, man, I got to quit eating as much. I got to get away from Matt's, you know, fish camp, you know, that fried fish. I mean, he's looking good. But listen, we should. We should work out, and we should take care of our bodies, but there is nothing we can do to change the fact that we're in perishable bodies. I did a funeral the other day for a man that was 96 years old. Been married 72 years and his wife was 94 and she was still living and she looked great. I think that's amazing. 96 years old. That's amazing. I want to live a long time. I'm planning on playing tennis at 100. I'm going for it. 
but I'm in a perishable body. And if you are, how many here in this, in this building, you're over 55? 55, just raise your hand. we got some 55s in here. we got a lot of young families. We've got 55 people. And how many of you that raise your hand, you went to at least one doctor in the month of August? You went to at least one doctor. When you get older, the first thing you think of when you get up in the morning is, got to have my coffee. Second thing is, what doctor do I have to go to today? I counted up the other day. I got eight doctors. I mean, I can't remember. I got a, I got a, uh, I got a dermatologist. I got a general physician. I got a urologist. I got a, uh, I got you know a doctor for my thyroid. I got a doctor. I got an orthopedic doctor specialist. We hang out together all the time. I have three knee surgeries. Like we're best friends. <laughs> but a perishable body is a body that is prone to decline. We're sown perishable. We get weaker. And it's the fact, and we have to, in fact, I went to a wedding yesterday. I did this wedding for this beautiful couple, and they were uh, 23. Both of them were 23 years old. The gal was a Ph.D. student at University of Delaware and a uh, real successful uh, groom there. And I looked at all those young people, and they are slick and young and just skinny and hair, and they looked amazing. And I'm like trying to get up out of my chair to go do the wedding, you know. But I'm thinking, you know, they have no idea. <laughs> Enjoy it. Love it. Lean into it. But it ain't going to last, honey. You know, a perishable body is a body that decays and ages. Now, there's a, I'm going to show you a picture. There's a somebody in your church. This is a picture of somebody in your church that's sitting in this auditorium today. And this person is in your auditorium today. Anybody recognize who this person is? Well, that is Rhett Parsons. And uh, we'll see his modern picture. This is that one of those aging apps there. And, uh, and Rhett showed me this the other day after the end of our board meeting. And he says, here's what I look like in 20 years. I said, you know, I think it's more like 10, Rhett. I'm not sure. <laughs> but we have to understand we're in a perishable body. What does COVID teach us? What does COVID, it's got a myriad of lessons, but one of the things that COVID teaches us is that we're in a perishable body. These bodies are prone to disease. And we, help, we try to be as healthy as we can, and we try to do as much as we can. This week, I, I opened up Facebook, and I gasped when I opened up Facebook, and I saw that a dear friend of mine, Reggie Coward from Pensacola, Florida, who died of COVID last week. And Reggie Coward was a guy that lived down the street from me in, in Bible college. He was a few years older than me, and he was... Uh, you know, he was a, a math teacher, and he came to Bible college, and we rode to class together. Every evening class that we had together, we rode together, and we talked together. We played tennis together, and Reggie was a little rigid. He was a little tough, and, you know, and I was like more grace and all that, and so we kind of made an interesting, odd couple, but, you know, he, 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 he left this world. He had a wonderful ministry to Viet Vietnamese people and loved people and served people. Had a great, fruitful ministry. But he was in a perishable body. And Paul said, that what is, that's what is sown perishable will be raised imperishable. And what we have to remember is this. We have to remember the fact that we need to uh, recognize the fact that these bodies that we live in are limited and it should keep us humble. It says in, uh, in, in uh, I think it's in Philippians 3.20, it says these lowly bodies that we're living in. Philippians 3.20, I think we have that verse. Let me read it to you real quickly. Philippians 3.20 says this. It says here, Philippians 3.20, just give me a second. Talk among yourselves here. It's going to happen in a second here. Philippians 3.20 Philippians 3.20, here it is, just hang on. I used to, I knew it was in here, I put it in here. Philippians, these lowly bodies, well, I can't find it, evidently I put it in there. But these lowly bodies that we live in will be transformed like his elevated body. So here's the thing, say this with me. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to take care of my body. 
but I'm in a perishable body. And one day, I'll get an imperishable body. It's like the lady that she went to the hospital. She was terminally ill. She goes to the hospital, and, and the doctor said, uh, you're, it's bad. You're, you know, you're terminal. You're not going to make it out of the hospital. And she was just, she prayed like Hezekiah in the Old Testament. Oh, Lord, I don't want to die. Let me live longer. And, and the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm going to give you 20 more years. And she was just like ecstatic. She thought, I'm going to make these 20 years count. And so what she did was, while she was in the hospital, she had liposuction. She had her, her eyes done. She got all fixed up. She even had a breast augmentation. This lady was going for it. And that she had a, a beautician come in and dye her hair red because she, you know, wanted always wanted to be a redhead. And she's being let out of the hospital. And she walks across the street and she gets hit by a truck and she gets killed. And she stands in front of the Lord and said, Lord, I can't believe this. You said you were going to give me 20 more years. And the Lord said, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. That was the cover for not finding the scripture. But anyhow, there we go. <laughs> but what is an imperishable body? An imperishable body is the exact opposite of a perishable body. And an imperishable body, the body, the body that we will receive is a body that will not age. It will not age. It will not get any wrinkles. I don't know what age will be in heaven. Uh, I recently read a book. Uh, this friend of mine wrote a book on Elvis coming back uh, to the earth, and he was in heaven. And uh, he said in the book that, uh, that the, the average age in heaven is 30 years old, that you'll be young. I don't know what age will be, but I know this. The body that you will inherit in the future, the physical body you inherit, will not age. It won't get older, and it will be impervious to, z to disease. There'll be no need for social distancing, no need for wearing masks. It doesn't matter what disease you were exposed to. If you have an imperishable body, it cannot die. It is a non-dying body, a body that will live forever and a body that can enjoy the glories of God's presence in a way that we cannot in our physical body handle. So an imperishable body, which is, you know, our, our normal bodies get weak, and they become frail. I was with my dad the other day. I love my dad dearly. He's 84 years old. He's still preaching. And um, I was hanging out with my dad. And, and my dad, when he was young, he took tons of vitamins and he lifted weights and he uh, used to run and he was in good shape. He was a water skier and really, really in good shape. Always took care of his body. He does push-ups every morning. Even to this day at 84 year old, years old, he does push-ups every morning. And I saw my dad that used to run down the road and that used to lift weights. I saw my dad struggle to get out of his chair because Paul said, this body that we live in is sown in weakness. What is the opposite of that? The opposite is our imperishable body is filled with power. It's filled with glory. And we will not have any weaknesses. And Paul said in another place, he said, if in this life only, if in this life only we have hope, we are men to be most miserable we need to be, uh, have a comprehensive view of God's plan for our future. The problem with our culture is we're all, a lot of us are Epicureans, Epicureans. You know, we're just living for today. We're living for the moment. We're living, and Paul says, listen, there's a, a vast eternal future in a physical body that will be rewarded by the Lord for serving the Lord. That's why he ends this chapter in saying, in verse 58, he says, he says uh, don't be weary in well-doing. You know, labor and work because your work will be rewarded. And, you know, listen, we don't want to live our lives just centered around having a good time. We want to have a good time. My, my truck is packed to go to OBX as soon as I leave here. I'm going to the beach. I'm going to have a great time this week. But let me tell you something. My life, and I know many of you, your life is not defined just by having a good time. You want to serve the Lord because if you serve the Lord and there's a physical resurrection, then you will be rewarded for your labor of love. Can you say a big amen? amen. Say that with me. It matters, it matters what I do while I'm on this earth. 
because there is a physical resurrection. I was, uh, the other day, uh, when I was over on the west side of the county, I was, uh, I went, I happened to ride by the graveyard where my mom is buried, and uh, my mom was a vivacious woman. I had, I have her personality. My mom was a cleric, uh, highly driven, uh, always had goals. I mean, she was a mover and shaker, and my dad's a little more laid back, but my mom, she was like, she was intense, and I, I inherited that. And she, uh, when she got, uh, you know, later in life, she had, she had Alzheimer's, and her, her, her weakness in her mind and her body just declined. And the last thing that happened a couple days before she died was she lost the ability to walk. And uh, the day before, she had gotten out of the house and walked a mile down the road. And we didn't know where she was. We're trying to always find her because she was so, so energetic. And she didn't have cognitive skills anymore. And she still could walk. But when she lost the ability to walk, I mean, that was just the, the end for her. And I stood over her grave. And I stood in front of her. And I miss her dearly. I love her dearly. She hugged me all the time. And she was... Uh, when I wrote my first book, she was my best salesman, and you know, sales haven't been as strong on the second book. It's my mom, you know. Uh, no, I think the book's doing fine. But anyhow, it was. Uh, but I don't know if you've ever done this. I I stood over her grave and I talked to my mom. Now I don't think she can hear me. My theology doesn't allow for her to hear me. I don't believe she hears me. I believe she's totally preoccupied with the Lord and the glory of the Lord. And I don't think that she. I can't communicate with the dead. I, I was just talking to her out of my heart. It was therapeutic for me. And I said, Mom, I miss you. And um, I said, Dad, he's, he's doing all right. He's not cleaning the dishes up out of the sink too good. That's a problem. But um, I said, uh, you know, just told her how much I loved her. But she's, she didn't hear that. That was just for me. Because she's with the Lord. And I stood over her grave, and I realized that that there's a moment in the history, and in her history in the future, where Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Philippians 3, and 1 Corinthians 15, that she will be raised up with a tangible body. She'll be able to hug me again. It's not like I'm going to see some image of my mom, but I'm going to feel her touch again. Because our resurrection is a tangible resurrection. Now, my mom was a great cook, and so I, I don't know. And I, I said this at her funeral when I preached her funeral. I said, I think one of the reasons that the Lord hasn't come back yet is my mom hasn't gone to heaven yet, hadn't gone to heaven yet, and she's such a great cook, God's going to use her at the marriage supper of the Lamb to cook. You know, I think that's one of the reasons. But she's going to be physically raised from the dead. You, you, when I take that into my heart, my worldview... My worldview says to me, because I love Jesus and because Jesus has been raised from the dead, I can have plagues and diseases all around me. I can age. I can get older. But I am aware that my future is a grand future because the Lord himself was raised from the dead. And Paul said, if Jesus has been raised from the dead, you will too. Would you lift your hands right now and let the Holy Spirit minister to you and encourage you? You have an amazing future. The gospel is full of power, full of glory, not only for this life, but for the life to come. And Lord, we repent of having such a narrow view. We just look at our present life. We look at our investments. We look at our neighborhood. We look at everything that's in front of us, and we struggle with depression and sadness because we have such a limited view. And your word says in Ecclesiastes, you put eternity in our hearts. We're supposed to think about more than just this life. And I pray if there's anybody listening today at Millsboro or online or in this auditorium at Femic Island that has not put their faith in Jesus, that they'll open up their heart and say, Jesus, be Lord of my life. And in doing so, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes to dwell in them to give them power. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hey, I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you for letting me hang out with you guys today. 